Um, I would next like to introduce uh, Bao Jin Hu, professor at York University's Earth and Space Science Engineering Department, and Rory Pittman, also of York University, to talk about their project. Um, Cameron, we pre-recorded the sentence to you. You want me to play it or you can play it from your end? Uh, yep. Just give me one second. Yeah, we saw the like uh, just uh, right. just uh, want to say hello to everyone. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we thought probably easier to pre-recording this just in case the internet got a problem. So we are here to like answer all of the questions after our talk. And uh, yeah, so. All right. I mute myself. Seems no voice is it only my problem or is everybody has a problem? Um, I can hear the audio. Um, oh, uh. <laughs> oh I, I don't know. Like right now, I cannot hear it. I don't know if my, only my problem or. Uh, it seems like it is not uh, just an issue um, on your end. Okay. Um, well then, um, perhaps uh, okay. we will. I can't do this. Eh? Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess. Cam, try to stop sharing your screen and share it again, but check the video option off oh, right. when you share. All right, let's just give that a try. Oh, I apologize. Share sound. All right, this might work better. Good morning. Uh, I'm Bao Xinhu, professor in dramatics and engineering at York University. I will talk about our project together with my students, Rory Pittman. Rory did his master research on this project, and he's currently in the first year for his PhD study. Uh, from the long title, uh, sorry about that, you can see that our project is to study the impact of land conversion on soil property use advanced remotely sensed data. This project is a collaborative, collaborative effort among my team at York University and uh, Dr. Webster and her team at NRCAN, Susan Marie, and Dr. Sean and her colleagues in Agriculture Canada, Ottawa. As we all know, global warming is projected to negatively affect crop production in some established air agricultural regions due to more irregular and extreme weather conditions during the growth season. However, the northward shift of the warmer climate may create the opportunity to re-evaluate the agricultural suitability of unexplored areas in the boreal region. To demonstrate this, I would like to show you some predicted scenarios based on several global climate models. This is from a paper published in 2018. It shows the boundary of a growing degree days, called DDD, visible for small cereal crops, such as baby and oat. This represents the minimum climatic requirements for agriculture. 
The source most of the boundaries are the actual situation for the period 2001 and 2005. The north moving trend of the boundaries is very clear. With the potential northward extension of crop production, it is anticipated that there will be increasing land use conversion in North Ontario. As we know, changes in land cover and land use, such as forest cleaning, clearing, cultivation, and pasture introduction, will change soil properties, physical, chemical, or biological. However, it is not clear how the direction and magnitude of these changes vary with the initial land use status, soil properties, and the subsequent land management practices. The goal of the project is to generate new knowledge on the impact of land use conversion on soil properties. The focus is on the disploitation of the advanced remote sensing data. Specifically, we develop a methodology to characterize soil properties in forest and agricultural land, and to assess how soil carbon stock and the greenhouse gas emissions are affected by land use conversion. The study area is a great clay belt area in Ontario, and uh, please ignore the points, the points in the figure right now. So there are the some plots for soil property. We will provide details on the plots later on. Advancing in remote sensing technologies makes more and more Earth observation data readily available. The data we use, including the following satellite optical imagery, provide surface reflectance. Satellite thermal images give us the surface temperature, airborne LiDAR data, elevation vegetation height can be derived from the airborne LiDAR data. And the satellite radar data, the surface, we can get the surface roughness and the moisture content from the radar data. As some examples, this is a true color composite of optical imagery over the study area. The spatial resolution is a 30 meter by 30 meter, which means one pixel in the image represents 30 meter by 30 meter on the ground, on the ground, and the vegetation appears green. And we can see the heavy 11 here. This uh, digital elevation model derived from LiDAR data. The spatial resolution is a 2 meter by 2 meter. We can clearly see the topographic features here. In the following, Rory will talk about a few detailed investigation we are working on with, the remote, with this remote sensing data. For the specific investigations, we have three main research topics or goals. So the first one corresponds to digital soil mapping. We're here. We utilize multi-source remotely sensed data to generate environmental covariates corresponding to different soil formation factors, which here included climate, vegetation, topography, and parent material, with the goal to accurately map soil properties for this region. A second research topic we looked at and are continuing to look at is the classification of forest cover types. We're here. We want the accurate characterization of forest cover types and species since this is critical to digital soil mapping since for example tree species indicators have high variable importance for this study area and as well we're interested in the evaluation of land conversion to the greenhouse gas emission a last research topic we're looking at is the development of a decision support system where here we want to look at agriculture potential in the great clay belt region for the digital soil mapping, the properties that we looked at here included classification properties, which here were soil texture type and moisture regime, where here the moisture regime corresponds to ecological land classification moisture regime. For continuous soil properties, here we looked at carbon content and bulk density. 
On this slide, we discuss the methods for the digital soil mapping. So for the advanced covariates, digital elevation model, and related topographic variables were derived from LIDAR data. Canopy height model and gap fraction were also derived from LIDAR data, which these were vegetation covariates, which haven't really been used much in digital soil mapping research. And for an ongoing uh, research, we're looking at forest cover types and species, which this is being obtained from multi-source remotely sensed data as well. For the modeling approach, uh, random forest models were used to select important variables in the prediction of the soil properties. And from that, that led to reduced sets of covariates. Random forests and support vector machines here, a linear basis and radial basis function support vector machines were applied for classification, whereas just random forest models were applied for regression type problems. And the uncertainty in the predicted soil properties was quantified here by using the entropy score metric. On this slide, is the study areas that was used for the classification type modeling of the soil properties. So here, this area altogether is known as the Great Clay Belt region. So within this, uh, we have three neighboring study areas. So the first one in the upper left outlined in magenta or pink is the Hearst study area, which is around the community or vicinity of Hearst. In the center, outlined in blue, is the Gordon Coastsons Forest Study Area. So the main community in the center there is Capuscasing. And then in the lower right, outlined in orange, is the BTB River Forest Study Region. And the main community in there is Smooth Rock Falls. So the data points here that are red, these were soil sampling uh, data locations, where here the samples corresponded to soil texture and moisture regime, and these were obtained from the Ontario Forest Resource Inventory. On this slide is the prediction maps for the classification of texture class. So uh, here, the dark color corresponds to peat, the light color or beige color uh, or cream color, if you want to call it that, corresponds to loamy, and then the pink color corresponds to clay soils. So here, uh, if this is compared with the previous slide with the true color composite, uh, we see that the areas that are peat correspond to the wetland areas, which will be primarily uh, black spruce. Uh, the clay eye areas uh, correspond to where the soil is more compacted. So there that will be in around the communities or where the farmland is. And the loamy soil can also be uh, some of the land uh, that's been cultivated as well, or corresponding to other forest types. On this slide are the classification maps for moisture regime. So the scaling for moisture regime here is depicted on the lower right, where here it's an ordinal scale that ranges from zero for dry up to nine for very wet. So in general for this area in the Great Clay Belt, uh, the moisture regimes tend to be very moist or wet where here the moistest or wettest areas would correspond to the peatland. On this slide is a summary of the model accuracy results for the classification models for soil texture class and moisture regime. So here, uh, in general, for the soil texture class, uh, the accuracies varied from around 0.75 to 0.78 for the BTP River Forest region but for the whole three areas combined, it was around 0.67. And here, the models had comparable accuracy between random forest and support vector machine. For the ECL moisture regime models, here we see that when the, since it was an ordinal scaling from zero to nine, when the classification was out by at most one category, uh, the accuracies improved. So here, there's comparable accuracy results between the random forest and support vector machine models, where in general, the BTP river forest had the highest accuracies. One should also note too, the BTP river forest also had um, more density sampling uh, per square kilometer.
So that could also explain that as well. So here is the study area for the collection of the soil data corresponding to carbon and bulk density, which are continuous properties. So here this study area corresponds around the community of Capuscasing. The samples here were collected in two field campaigns by York University graduate students in September 2018 and August 2019. And here the objective was to sample from a variety of different land cover types in close proximity to one another. So that's why you'll see that there's a cluster of like three or four sites relatively close to one another where the sites uh, selected correspond to different land cover type. These photos correspond to different land cover types that we're able to obtain soil samples from in and around primarily the community of Capuscasing. The image on the upper left corresponds to abandoned yard site. The image on the upper right corresponds to a wetland environment. The image on the lower left corresponds to land that was recently cleared and mulched the fall before. An interesting thing to note, which you may or may not see, is that there are trees in the background that are reddish or brown in color, which correspond to balsam fir that had recently died now that they get more sunlight, now that the land in front of them has been cleared. And in the image on the lower right corresponds to black spruce in a mature tree setting. On this slide here are other land cover types. In the upper left is an abandoned pasture where we can see trees are starting to grow back. In the upper right is a second growth black spruce, white spruce environment. And then the lower left was where we encountered some balsam poplar trees. And then the lower right was kind of a more uh, mature tree setting. These are some photos that were taken of the field work. So in the upper left are soil samples being retrieved in an agricultural field. On the upper right are the bulk density rings and the hammer that was used to extract the bulk density samples. On the images below is the heavy clay that was encountered roughly 20 to 25 centimeters below the surface. Hence, I guess why this area is called the Great Clay Belt. We want to note that the bulk density and chemistry samples that were obtained were processed in Sault Ste. Marie approximately three months after they're extracted. On this slide, here are some images of some of the different uh, soil types that we encountered. So on the left-hand side, this was uh, a peat environment here. So you can see the peat soil, the dark soil underneath the uh, divot layer. And then on the right there, these would be the first one, these would be pasture lands. So here it was grass on top. And as we can see, the soil is more compacted. Here are the projection maps for bulk density. So on the left is average bulk density projection map, but as well too, we uh, calculate the standard deviation among the bulk density values. So looking at the average bulk density, we can see that the areas that have the uh, highest bulk density are the compacted areas, which correspond to the cropland. And then the areas that have the lowest correspond to the peatlands or the wetland environments. And then looking at the standard deviation of bulk density, we can see that the settled areas or the agriculture areas had the lowest standard deviation of bulk density, where the most standard deviation occurred in the forested areas. And we can see that below when comparing to the true color composite. Here for the prediction maps for total carbon, on the upper left, we have the prediction map for average carbon. So in general, the forested areas, especially the uh, peatland environments, had higher average carbon values. And when we look at the standard deviation prediction map, of total carbon on the upper right. Here we see that in general the highest standard deviations among the total carbon projections were with the settled areas. On this slide are the results of our uh, models here, which here are random forest models. 
for the prediction of average bulk density, standard deviation of bulk density, average carbon, and standard deviation of carbon. So in general, the R squared values were better for the carbon models, where we want to note that we're able to get fairly accurate carbon models and even standard deviation of bulk density models uh, just utilizing 12 predictors, where here this included canopy height model, gap fraction, and NDVI values. For the findings for the digital soil mapping, we found that agricultural land had higher bulk densities, which makes sense since agricultural land tends to be more compacted. The wetlands, i.e. the peatlands, had the lower bulk densities and the highest total carbon values and correspondingly the wettest moisture regimes. Clay ISO had the lowest carbon content and the highest bulk densities, and the lowest modeling uncertainties occurred with the prediction of peat, whereas areas corresponding to clay I soils had the highest modeling uncertainties. We also found that covariates relating to vegetation had the highest variable importance among the different soil formation factors. We have also worked on uh, tree species classification. We're here, we've utilized remotely sensed data, the main sources being worldview satellite imagery, as well as LIDAR data. We're here, the focus is on using uh, finer spatial resolution data. The features used for tree species prediction include surface reflectance, normalized different indexes, canopy height model, and topographic covariates. And the classification methods we used include random forest and support vector machine. On the left is the tree species prediction map, which here this corresponds to a study area in the a BTB river forest. In the center is the true color composite of the same area. Note that the study area corresponds to worldview 2 imagery, whereas in the background it's Landsat imagery, which is coarser at 30 meters resolution. The worldview 2 imagery, on the other hand, is at 2 meters spatial resolution. And on the right is the canopy height model. Note that the white gap area uh, is due to the bounds of the LIDAR data for that study area. Looking at the tree species prediction map, here the five tree species are black spruce, balsam fir, larch, white spruce, and eastern cedar. Here are the modeling accuracies for the tree species classification. From the table above, we can see that the random forest approach gave great accuracies, but support vector machines gave good accuracies as well. On the table below is the user accuracies for the five different tree species for this study area. Uh, note that the accuracies here were good for uh, most of the tree species, uh, except the eastern cedar for the support vector machine. But note that the eastern cedar had the least amount of uh, coverage area for this region. The most common tree species for this region was the black spruce, which had higher user accuracies. We also looked at a project of trying to determine agriculture potential. And for this here, we utilize analytical hierarchy process to determine areas most feasible for agriculture in the Gordon Cosins forest region of the district of Cochrane. So for this here, we considered six attribute layers which correspond to criteria for accessibility and soil property considerations. And these were distances to roads, distances to water bodies, soil texture, moisture regime, uh, canopy height model, and slope, where we utilize fuzzy logic inference on these attributes to determine ranges of suitability. Afterwards, a three-step process as specifying and normalizing pairwise comparisons among the attributes was utilized, where this eventually led to final weightings for combining the attribute layers. Here is a prediction map that the analytical hierarchy process came up with for determining areas most suitable for agriculture in the Gordon Coastlands Forest. So here, the most suitable areas corresponded to existing cropland, which uh, here exists around the community of Capuscasing, but as well, we also see areas in the southeastern portion, uh, which here have higher agriculture suitability, which this is based upon the six attributes 
that we utilize for our criteria. In conclusion, uh, even though promising results are obtained in all investigations, uh, research are being underway to improve the methods. Hopefully, the field work can be resumed this year, this summer, so that uh, we can collect more soil data, especially the carbon, uh, carbon data. We are uh, also exploring the information fusion and the deep learning uh, to improve digital soil mapping and forest species classification. For the decision support systems, we are at a very early stage, so we will add more factors, tools, and applications. In addition, we are also working on the utilization of a remote sensing technology to a wide range of applications in precision agriculture, uh, such as yield estimation, um, estimation, stress detection, uh, variable fertilization. And um, in addition to the satellite and aerial remote sensing data, we also uh, collect the data use of our own drone uh, in the lab. And we are actively looking for input and collaborations to improve our research. Uh, if you are interested, in, please contact me. So my email address here. Um, I would like to end this presentation by acknowledge our funding agencies and uh, collaborators to help with uh, the field work and the lab measurements. Uh, I we especially would like to thank the local communities of uh, Capsicasi and the Hearst and uh, Amafa for the help uh, with our field work. Also, we would like we we also like to thank all of the uh, um, data providers. In the end, uh, I would like to uh, thank the organizer gave us the opportunity to share uh, our research. And uh, thank you. So this is the end of our presentation. So we um, welcome any input, questions, comments. Thank you, Rory and uh, Bao Jin. Um, I have uh, several questions here, um, if you are ready to answer them. OK, sure. I'll go first, Vera. Laurie, <laughs> I need your help. <laughs> you jump in, OK? OK, and vice versa. <laughs> OK. Perfect. Um, so you mentioned uh, at the end there that you are looking for more uh, input and collaborations during your project. Um, what sort of uh, input or especially collaborations would you be looking for? Would that be farmers or perhaps other academic partners? And what would, uh, what would their role be? Um, both actually. So we would like to hear more about the local community to see what we can help in term, like say, improve the um, their practice, and uh, and also like in term for our project, like we do the prediction, like I mentioned earlier, like we do need uh, like collect the data from the local uh, in the farms, farmland or agriculture land. And some we collected in the crown land, some we do collected like in the farmer's land. So um, we probably need help uh, as well. And uh, in turn, collect the more data. And another one is uh, like uh, application. So we are doing research, especially in my group, we are trying to look at how the remote sensing technology can help in the precision agriculture. So we looking forward to hear about the, what kind of thing we can do. We can think of some project ourselves, but sometimes just like probably sitting in the room, kind of dreaming of certain applications we would love to get some input to get the real, what's the real problem there, what we can help. So basically, we are looking for uh, both from the academic as well. So remote sensing is a multi-disciplinary research. So we are just uh, like a one piece of a puzzle. So we would like to collaborate. If anybody think we can help, and uh, so we would love to collaborate as well. So. All right. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to uh, the results of this project, especially the maps. Uh, do you have any plans to um, 
perhaps make those available and uh, overlay them with any of the other sort of OMAFRA soil maps or perhaps uh, crown land maps, anything like that? Yeah, like in term, this is as a part of our project, I think we can make this uh, map available, but in term, the features, uh, that's again, we need the input, otherwise we don't know, like see, what's the use of this, what kind of map we can overlay with it, and uh, we can overlay with uh, wherever the lab, the map is available there, um, but uh, like again, so if anybody interested to see how our results compare with the existing or whatever so we love to hear about it and if there's a, like a map existing we can overlay whatever uh, existing map uh, so we, and also we do publish some papers so i think i can like see uh, send the information and you can read if you were interested more about our research methodology we can make uh, available as well so Perfect, that uh, answers another question. Um, so do you have a uh, percentage comparison of uh, say peat versus clay versus loam, uh, the different soil types? Like, like right now, probably Rory can like jump in some, but right now what we do is we based on whenever the data available to us, we make a prediction. So we develop a method and use some covariant to predict the soil property. Like right now, what we depend on part, you know, addition to the data we collected, the carbon, the bulk density, and we strong, like heavily rely on existing data. So mainly is uh, for us, the inventory data provided by the, uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources. So whenever the data available, we use them. But if there is a legacy, somebody know uh, some data gave more information, the quantitative information, or we call the continuous variable in terms of the percentage or like it's moisture content, we can do the correlation and do the modeling. But right now, we totally depend on whenever available data in the public domain. Okay, interesting. Um, and so in your presentation, I believe you used a scale of, uh, was it zero to nine uh, to define moisture levels? Um, could you perhaps give us some uh, concrete descriptions of what the, of what those numbers would be? So I assume one would be, you know, very solid ground and nine would be, well, you're swimming, but uh, what would be five? <laughs> would that be, you know, uh, farmable land? Jari? <laughs> you take over because well, you're already What I want to say is this was data that was provided to us, and this is based on ecological land classification moisture regime, which I believe was created in Ontario. And I think it was created for forestry purposes. So uh, from my understanding of it, uh, zero would be dry, and then it goes from dry to fresh to moist to wet and then uh, very wet and then I think there's even a couple letters s for like saturated beyond nine um, so as for what uh, would be cutoffs for uh, acceptable for farmland I would say that the existing farmland near Capuscasing where there is agriculture it tends to be moist around there mm -hmm. so I mean obviously this is going to vary you know from this area if the same scaling was done in southern Ontario but that's what I would say right now is for the existing farmland up there, I'd say this area tends to have a lot of surface moisture as an issue. So it's a wetter area, but I'd say around moist for existing farmland. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks a lot, Rory and uh, Baojin. Thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.